Dr. Dr. Campbell, uh, can you hear us? Uh, yes, I can. Okay, my name's Jim Nolan, uh, and uh, we've got the pictures and the audio up live here into the uh, conference center. Um, so we're ready to go with your case whenever you are. Great. Uh, well, greetings from North Carolina, and uh, we appreciate the opportunity to uh, share a case of uh, radial robotic uh, intervention. Uh, last year at the AIM Radial Conference 2014 in Chicago, I presented two complex radial robotic cases. Uh, one was an LED diagonal requiring two wires and a multiple balloon pre-lotations, post-lotations, and stent placement. I also presented a complex right radial Rima Lima case where we opened and included RCA robotically as well. And last year, Olivier Bertrand, Dr. Bertrand, uh, expressed to me after the uh, cases that uh, there were some questions about uh, the robotic device, about the room setup, about the equipment, about just how much hands-on the interventional cardiologist had. And he suggested uh, perhaps in the future either a film or a live case demonstration would be helpful to uh, orient the conference attendees as to what is uh, robotic intervention entails and just how we uh, do robotic intervention, how the room's set up, how the teamwork concept uh, comes into play. Uh, he also mentioned, uh, Dr. Nolan, that you're uh, very interested in uh, radiation exposure. And uh, one of the key advantages of robotic intervention is we have a, a radiation shielded cockpit and uh, it's been shown to reduce radiation exposure to the operator, the physician, by up to 95%. And so uh, we thought we'd also highlight some of our uh, radiation uh, awareness and radiation monitoring aspects that we use in our lab as well as the uh, safety feature of the robotic uh, intervention. Uh, I'd like to start by introducing our team here today. Uh, we have our lead robotic technician, uh, Patrick Tennis. Um, we have um, our circulating nurse, uh, Melody Correll. Uh, we have Carla Bittler, our uh, circulator too. And uh, we have Jared Cashel, who's our uh, monitor uh, nurse, uh, who's going to be monitoring our case. And most importantly, we thank our patient uh, who has consented to uh, have us uh, show his case as a demonstration of robotic uh, intervention. Uh, if we could have the slides, I'll uh, present the case, please. Okay, uh, go to the next slide. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Uh, next. Um, and this is our equipment that uh, we use, and we'll be going over uh, some of this in regards to uh, how we use the equipment, the uh, interventional cockpit, our control console, and our bedside unit. So the case, uh, the uh, patient's a 60-year-old gentleman with a history of diabetes, hyperlipidemia, and hypothyroidism with distant tobacco use who presented with a two-month history of exertional chest discomfort and dyspnea. Uh, he had a positive treadmill stress echo for both inferior and inferior lateral ischemia. Uh, showing up as hypokinesis associated with his exertional symptoms. He actually underwent a, a diagnostic left heart cath uh, last month, uh, done via the right transradial approach. He was found to have a 99% mid right coronary artery stenosis uh, and a 75% obtuse marginal two branch lesion. He received a 3 by 12 millimeter Abbott uh, Alpine drug eluting stent, Zion's Alpine drug eluting stent, opening up his RCA, and he comes back today for staged intervention of his marginal two-branch lesion. And uh, this is an image of his uh, RCA lesion, which was uh, uh, very tight, which was opened last month. Um, got a nice result pre and post with the stent. And this is the lesion in the circ marginal, which we're planning on opening up uh, today uh, in different uh, views. Um, so um, what I... Uh, uh, Plan to do the, the, the some of the confusion in regards to uh, uh, robotic intervention was that the cardiologist doesn't get involved, the cardiologist doesn't come in the room. Um, in actuality, I uh, got access here uh, in the right radial artery with a six French drumo glide sheath. Um, I placed a uh, guide catheter, uh, which is a, a Boston Scientific VL35 guider in the left main and took scout shots. Um, and so I actually do get my hands involved. I do get involved with the patient and involved with the room. But once I've gotten access and gotten the guide in, in place, uh, typically uh, we remove our lead and can go back behind the uh, radiation uh, shielded uh, cockpit. Um, Patrick, who's uh, uh, one of our techs here, then uh, is the uh, main 
individual at the bedside who works with uh, uh, setting up the uh, bedside unit. Um, so what we have uh, to go over our room uh, setup here, um, I guess we can pan back. This is our radiation uh, shielded um, cockpit, uh, that, which is where I'll be working with the robotic uh, device. And um, in the cockpit, we've got uh, three different monitors. We've got a, uh, a fluoroscopy monitor. We've got a scout monitor for our scout films. We've got a hemodynamic and EKG monitor uh, as well. And he's going to be bringing the camera around to, to uh, uh, show this. Um, inside the uh, uh, con control cockpit, we have a uh, physician uh, console uh, control, and that, uh, which he'll zoom in on uh, for us has two joysticks and a, a touch screen uh, for uh, movement and control of the uh, uh, devices. The joystick on the right controls linear and rotational motion of the guide wires. The joystick on the left controls uh, linear movement and, and uh, rotation of the balloon catheters, the stents, uh, the devices that are placed over the guide wire. The touch screen, uh, which we'll demonstrate here in just a few minutes, um, allows us to make measurements and to make submillimeter movements of the guide wire, the balloon, and the stent. Um, and the measurement, the precision measurement capacity of this system we found very helpful in terms of uh, uh, measuring lesions. Uh, we are looking at a three-dimensional object that's moving in two dimensions. And we've got a lot of uh, uh, vessels that are on bends. They have overlap. There's foreshortening. There's um, tortuosity. And uh, we find much more uh, accurate measurement using the robotic device down to a tenth of a millimeter. When we looked at our first 60 robotic cases when we started here, um, we actually found that we were accurate estimating lesion lengths about a third of the time. We were short about a third of the time. We were long about a third of the time. We are part of a precision registry where we estimated a lesion length, selected a stent size, then went ahead and measured the lesion length, and, and we saw whether that changed our stent selection, and in fact, it did in a high percentage of, of time. Um, the bedside unit uh, consists of an articulated arm that's attached to the uh, cath table. The articulated arm is attached to the robotic drive unit, uh, which is what's in front of uh, Patrick there. The uh, drive unit has a single-use sterile cassette that's loaded uh, for each case. And uh, it's through that cassette that the guide wire is loaded through the robotic uh, um, drive unit and advanced up uh, in the guide catheter to uh, cross the uh, coronary lesion and guide the balloons and stents. The guide catheter is attached to the um, cassette after we get it in place. And it's um, kind of clamped down uh, so that it doesn't uh, move. Uh, this can be rotated for a right radial case, for a left radial case, for a right or left femoral case. Uh, it can move around the table and it's uh, uh, easily adjustable. We keep it on the table all the time and uh, when we are going to do a robotic case, the arm uh, swings out. Similarly, uh, in regards to this uh, cockpit, um, the cockpit is pulled back against the wall when we're doing diagnostic catheterizations. And when uh, we uh, do a robotic intervention, it's simply wheeled about 12 inches forward and uh, activated, and we go go with the case. Um, the other, uh, so we mentioned about a 95% reduction in radiation. We this has got us more radi uh, radiation sensitive, and uh, we were thinking this is a great uh, advance for physicians. It drops radiation by 95% according to the precise trial. Uh, but we also wanted to see what we could do for our staff, and so we uh, do the standard procedures with lead skirts and lead vests and thyroid collars, uh, but we also have a pelvic drape that's placed on for radial cases to reduce uh, radiation scatter. We use 15 frames per second, low-dose fluoro and fluoro save for our uh, uh, filming while we're doing interventions. Um, we also have what's called a ray-safe monitoring system, which is a dosimetry monitoring system that gives us Wi-Fi feedback for each member of our team. So the physician, the technician, the circulator one, circulator two, and the control room each have their own badge. We reset this to zero for each case. And we found this to be uh, helpful both for not only monitoring but also for giving us feedback. It's uh, um, altered kind of some of the angles we take and we've actually used an extra um, 
vertical shield since we've adopted this uh, race safe system because we saw when we did our LAO shots, some of our lateral shots uh, would get us a pretty good radiation scatter, and we reduced that by a vertical shield, which we've placed. It's called a Chatham Up shield we have next to the table. We also use the ceiling mounted uh, fluoro screen. So, um, not only has this device reduced the physician's radiation, but it's helped, helped us be more aware of radiation safety uh, for our lab. So, what we're going to do now is we're going to uh, have Patrick uh, uh, show how we place the wire in the robotic drive device how he places the balloon catheter uh, over the wire and feeds it up. And then I'll be showing how we use the um, uh, control monitor to uh, move the uh, devices. So he's opening up the uh, control arm. Uh, the uh, drive unit has uh, channels which the guide wire is placed. The wires uh, had a bend put on the end. He's uh, putting a bend on the end of the wire, a standard, standard uh, bend to get down the circumflex. Um, loading up the wire in the guider, and then the wire is going to go down the wire track, uh, which goes down the center of the uh, drive unit. Um, we then place the balloon uh, over the wire. Uh, we're going to pre-dilate this with a uh, uh, 2.5 by 12 uh, Euphora uh, balloon. And he's placing that over the guide wire, and that's going to go uh, in the drive uh, train of the robotic uh, drive device as well. So he's placing that over the wire. And uh, can I ask you, uh, do you wear any radiation protection lead when you're in the control cockpit there? Or? I'm sorry, uh, I couldn't hear you. The, con the control cockpit? Yeah, when, when you're in the control cockpit doing the angioplasty, do you wear any radiation protection lead at all? Or? No, uh, basically I'm sitting down here while he's, you know, when he's flooring or doing uh, uh, synangiograms. Um, I have my race safe badge and my standard monitoring badge on my pocket here. Uh, but the uh, precise trial showed a 95% reduction in radiation to the physician, and that was after the physician actually did the diagnostic part of the test. So, so it might have been even 98 or 99 percent. But uh, no, I don't wear lead. Uh, the advantage here is not only do we reduce our X-ray exposure in regards to, you know, potential tumors, lymphomas, uh, and cataracts, uh, posterior lens cataracts. We also sit in a comfortable chair ergonomically. I've got screens less than 12 inches in front of me. 60% um, of interventional cardiologists with 20 plus year experience have uh, back problems and orthopedic problems from wearing the lead. Um, this is one uh, way to consider ex extending your career. I've been doing this next year will be 25 years. So um, basically it's very comfortable. It's ergonomically sound. I've got the screens right in front of me. I don't, I don't have lead on. Um, I get better visualization. Uh, and uh, we find this uh, a tremendous advantage. On a long day when you've got a lot of cases, being able to sit down and not stand with the lead on uh, uh, over time uh, really makes you uh, less fatigued at the end of the day and improves your concentration. Yeah, I'm sure that's, uh, that's an important point. Uh, are they radiation protection uh, caps that you guys are wearing though? Oh yeah, I forgot to mention. So uh, we also use the RADPAD no-brainer caps. Uh, you know, there has been, most are aware of the studies looking at uh, brain tumors and interventional cardiologists and radiologists, 85% uh, were left-sided. Uh, if it was given the chance, it would be 50-50. Most of us are right-handed and, and the radiation x-ray source is to our left. And that uh, the hypothesis is that's why uh, most of these tumors were found to be on the left side of the brain. So we wear no-brainer lead hats for our procedures as well, and that's another aspect that we uh, use for uh, shielding and reducing radiation exposure. Do you uh, do you throw them away and change them after after a day or a case? Or I mean, I reuse mine endlessly. Um, I personally don't. Uh, what happens is the ties wear out, so I keep them for about, they last about four to six weeks in my experience. So uh, they are disposable, but... Um, I actually keep them until the ties in the back wear out, and that's about after four to six weeks. So uh, yeah. uh, um, they're, 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 I think, economical and cost-effective if I use 10 to 12 a, a, a year. So, yeah. 
Okay, so um, I have enabled the system. I don't know if you can uh, we can see down here. I've enabled enabled the system, and um, I'm going to be advancing the guide wire using this right started uh, joystick. Uh, again, this uh, has linear and rotational motion, so I can advance it forward or backward. I can turn it clockwise or counterclockwise uh, as we normally torque a wire. And a little puff there, Patrick. So I'm advancing it forward. I'm going to torque it up or, or rotate it up. Um, a little puff there, Patrick. All right, done a little branch there. So I'm coming back. I'm going to rotate it, rotate the uh, wire up. Puff there. Rotate it down. And we're getting out little branches, rotating it back up. OK, so that's pretty straightforward. Now, what I do at this point is the measurement uh, function of this device we found uh, very helpful. It measures lesions precisely. This looks to be about six to eight millimeters in my estimation. I would estimate I'd probably put a 12 millimeter stem. But what I'm going to do is come back with the wire. You can measure with the wire or the balloon. So the mandrel or the dark part of the wire, I'm going to get right to the distal part of the lesion. Puff there. OK. And I'm going to reset the counter here uh, on my touch screen. I'm then going to touch the, uh, pull it back on, by millimeter, millimeter segments as it's measuring. And give me one more puff there, Patrick. Okay, that's 7.7 .7 millimeters. Right. Puff there. So uh, I'm advancing my wire. So the, the key thing about measurements are if I estimated a lesion is uh, 8 millimeters, I'm going to put a 12 millimeter stent in and it actually measures 13.9. I would miss the edge of a lesion by 1.9 millimeters. That doesn't sound like much, but that's called longitudinal geographic miss. If you notice that at the end of the case, you typically put a second stent in. If you don't notice that, those patients with longitudinal geographic miss, based on the Stellar trial, have about a 2.5, uh, 2.5 time chance of coming back for target vessel revascularization. So um, we, we uh, found that uh, in our initial experience, when we looked at our uh, uh, change in stent selection based on measurements, uh, actually uh, almost uh, half to two-thirds of the time it changed our, our stent selection uh, in regards to accuracy. Um, on the other hand, if you put in too long a stent, for every 10 millimeters of excess bare metal stent, there's a 4% uh, greater late loss. And for every 10 millimeters for uh, drug looting stents, there's a, a 2 millimeter late loss. So too long a stent or too short a stent is not really what you want. You want precision and accuracy, and I think that's what this system gives us. So I'm now going to advance the balloon. Patrick's got the balloon on the stent. Now, I advance the balloon with the left joystick, and I have a button over here called the Turbo Boost. And with my left index finger, if I uh, advance the button, it goes at a faster speed and gets it down the guider faster. I'm now going to advance the balloon uh, down into the artery. Uh, and puff there, Patrick. All right. All right, puff there. All right. I think we're pretty good there. So we're going to go up and pre-dilate. This is a 2.5 millimeter uh, euphoria balloon from Medtronic. May have some pain here, sir. All right, fluorosafe. All right, so Patrick, we, we do fluorosafe for the images where we're not uh, finishing up to reduce radiation as well. And I've got my monitor here with the clock right here at the uh, Bedside unit. We're going to come down at uh, 30 seconds, please. Balloons down. How you doing, sir? You okay, Charles? He's doing fine, sir. All uh, right. And now we're going to retract the balloon. And again, we can uh, tur turbo boost it back. And then, Patrick, uh, let's go ahead and uh, take an image. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. Sir. Eject. Okay, fluoro save. Done. All right. So uh, that's our image. I don't know if we can loop that. Um, so that was the first one. Well, 
let's get back to here. So there's our uh, uh, pre dilatation. Um, we, uh, we looked at this. It looks to be between three and three and a half millimeters. We were planning on putting a short uh, 12 millimeter uh, drug eluting stent in that area. There is some plaque that goes up towards the osteum. My plan was just to try to spot this area uh, and uh, stay away from the osteum there. So what I'm going to do now is pull the, we're going to retract the balloon. We're going to uh, turbo boost the balloon back, which is going to come out the end of the uh, drive unit on the bed there. And he's going to tell me when it's out of the drive unit. <coughs> You're out, sir. All right. So now he is going to release the uh, uh, lock on the drive unit. It's going to open it up. Uh, he's going to open up the uh, uh, ports and uh, retrieve the balloon while keeping the wire up. He's just holding the wire down with his finger there on the drive unit. Now we have our cockpit right next to the table here. The cockpit is oriented at the patient's right leg uh, area. This is the same orientation we have when we stand at the table. So we found um, we're all creatures of habit and our brains are entrained to be looking at the uh, uh, at the images uh, from the right side of the patient down towards the leg. Uh, and so we placed our uh, radiation shielded cockpit here in that area just behind the where the technician stands. The other thing I failed to mention in terms of radiation safety, we switched our um, extension tubing for injecting contrast from the standard 24 millimeter tubing to 48 millimeter tubing to allow the technician to be farther uh, down uh, Away, farther away from the radiation source and reduce exposure. So he's got a 48 centimeter uh, extension tubing. I'm going to put a 325 three, 12 um, Alpine drug looting stamp, please. So our frame rate that we routinely use is 7.5 now in our cath lab. Um, now, obviously, you have to turn that up on occasions with the uh, patients with a bigger BMI, but I would say we probably do 85, 90% of all the work on that 7.5 frame rate for screening. Oh, that's a good, good suggestion. Yeah, we, sh we should try that. We went, we used to do 30, we went down to 15, but 7.5, if it works yeah. with, the, with the digital imaging that's now, I'm sure you'll yeah. probably get good images there. I mean, to be honest, what we did was we turned it down and we didn't tell the other guys and they never noticed. <laughs> oh, that's a great idea. I think we may try that here uh, after this conference. I'm kind of interested in the positioning of the radiation shield that you've got there because it's pushed close to the tube, which obviously, you know, t tends to limit scatter in the room. But whenever I've talked to radiation physicists, the advice consistently given to me is to have the shield close to you as the operator. It protects you more then. So, you know, having it pushed against the, uh, the intensifier as you have there, it will limit the scatter around the room, but if you want to optimize and maximize your protection, you want to get that thing close to you and get in its shadow. Yeah, a good, good suggestion. Um, we recently implemented that based on what we saw with the uh, race safe badges with LAO shots, and so, uh, yeah, that is true. We have, a, we have a mat on the floor. It's got wheels on it. It is a little bit... Yeah. Uh, cumbersome, but yeah, the closer it is to the uh, uh, the closer it is to the operator, the less uh, radiation. Yeah. So that's a good idea. I mean, the use of the uh, of a standard lead, uh, the bottom half of a two part lead apron over the patient's abdomen and pelvis is a fantastic way to reduce um, backscatter exposure for the people in the room. You know, you can do it in every cath lab tomorrow. Most yeah. people don't bother. It. Yeah, we we use the uh, bottom part of a lead shield uh, lead. Uh, outfit for for years, and now we're I guess switched over to a uh, rad pad type device because that's what they wanted to switch to. But uh, there is one in place at this time uh, as well. Uh, Paul, can I ask a question to one of the panelists? Um, you, you mentioned a ninety five percent reduction in the cardiologist's dose, but but obviously the, your technician's dose is going to be significantly higher because you're no longer standing between him and the tube. So I wondered what the the reduction in the overall team's dose is uh, with this technology. Uh, well, that's what we're actually looking at. We are doing a study with these race safe badges, looking at everybody's radiation um, on the team. So uh, it's a small pilot study, but we're about uh, well, we're about halfway through. Uh, but that is a great question. Um, and when we talked about the reduction in radiation for the operator, uh, that next question was, what about the team? And so 
Uh, that's why we've implemented a lot of these strategies and we're going to be looking at what is the radiation for each of the operators manual versus the robotic device. So we're going to advance the stent here. Uh, give me a little puff there, Patrick. Okay. I've got the guide. So I'm driving the stent forward with the joystick. I'm just advancing it forward. Puff there. All right. And puff there. Step down a little bit. All right. Let's take an image. Ready? Sir. Sure. Project. Thorough Done. Okay, and loop that. Okay, uh, it's moving a little bit. I think we're uh, covering it there. You agree, Patrick? I do, sir. All right, and let's go up with the balloon. May have some pain here, sir. I think you can see there, Tim, that uh, Patrick, the technician, is standing quite a long way back from the uh, the puncture site. So, you know, he's using the inverse square law to drop his radiation. So, you know, if you can get that far away, you're not getting a lot of radiation anyway. But I think a lot of things that you can do without that machine can reduce the Yeah. Floor is safe. I'm a little surprised that the, the device itself doesn't do the balloon inflations. Uh, is there a look at doing that? I mean, why does somebody have to stand there and do that? Well, um, there are some hospitals that use the assist injection device. Um, come on down, Pat. Yeah, sir. And uh, they inject from the cockpit. We are looking into that. Uh, in terms of inflation, that's something that may be one of the future iterations. Um, all right, we're going to come back with the uh, balloon. Can I just make a comment about the pelvic shield? Um, one of the problems we had in our cath lab was concern about infection control if you just use any old lead with the material that's there. So we, we chopped it apart and uh, found that the lead inside is much easier to manipulate and you can choose the right size. It doesn't need to be hanging around all over the place and you can clean it very easily. Yeah. Well, you can use a rad pad, can't you, Julian? If, you, if there is a legitimate and valid concern about that, you can use a rad pad disposable for every case. Of want. course, but it's much cheaper to chop the lead yeah. up and... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, what, it's a lot easier to put on. Yeah, what we do is put the rad pad in a, in a sterile plastic bag and, and just it's a single use. Yeah, okay. single use bag. All right. You ready, Patrick? Sorry. All right. Checked. Okay. Uh, let's rotate over in the uh, LAO view. So I think we got the lesion there. We got a little uh, step up there. I don't, we'll take a look and see if there's a. Uh, crack there at the edge, but um, it may just be a step up and step down there. Okay, floor, sir. Ready? All right. Checked. All right, floor safe. And loop that. Looks pretty good in that projection, isn't it? Yeah, it looks pretty good there. Uh, we yeah. could probably give a little nitroglycerin. Nitro. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we've got a, a, one of the key advantages of, of doing this over the past uh, a year and a half in our, our cath lab is the technical skills of our staff have improved greatly. Um, it's in, in increased enthusiasm, our, our, our teamwork has increased, our team morale has, has really been boosted, and our, our uh, staff turnover has gone down. So, um, you know, we have three different generations of technicians. Patrick's been doing this for over 25 years. We have folks that have uh, been doing this about 10 years, and some of our techs are grad or students that just graduated a year or two ago. And so this is something that uh, all of our tech technicians uh, rotate through or involved with. Um, if it's their case and it's a robotic case, they, uh, they get up there and do it. Um, uh, certainly Patrick's excellent. He's been our lead robotic tech. Um, the training for this is they uh, – ready? They went up to uh, uh, Massachusetts, got trained. You work with a simulator, and then they've come back and worked here on cases. And we've done several hundred, and obviously you get better the more you do. So we're going to go ahead and uh, take another image here. You ready? Sir. Check there. All right, floral save. Let's go back to that other view, please. Um, and uh, we found it's been a, uh, uh, a real boost in, in uh, improving technical <clears throat> skills of our staff. Um, and uh, also, uh, also the morale of our of our staff. Um, 
I see that you, you're using the stored flora mode for a lot of your uh, check and geography, which obviously is a, is a massive reduction in radiation dose, so it's a clever strategy to, uh, to use that, I think. Right. And we actually, you know, we do diagnostic cases. If you've got a real thin woman, a real thin patient, you can actually do diagnostic cases with fluorosave, particularly normal coronaries and things like that. Uh, uh, you know, if you have images you can't see well, then we do it. But you can, you do, fluoro, you can do fluorosave with even your diagnostic cases. You ready, Patrick? Yes, sir. Right. Can you say when you decide to use the robotic device? Fluorosafe. In which cases? Uh, no. Yeah. Um, let me just uh, pull this wire back and take some final pics, and then we can, if it's that okay, we'll discuss that. Uh, Looks a lot better now that you've given the nitrate. Uh, there must have been a bit of spasm in the outflow there. Yeah, I think it looks good. We're going to turbo boost the wire back. All right, we'll take some final pictures, Patrick. Yes, sir, ready. Right. Eject. I think that looks good. And let's go yeah. on the uh, LAO shot. So to answer your question, um, my strategy is... I look to use the robot in every case I can. Who do I not use it in? I don't personally use it in unstable patients. Um, there's an abstract going to be presented, my understanding, at TCT from Michigan in their early experience where they, they saw they added about 13 minutes a case. In our last 30 cases, which we looked at not published data, um, the difference, uh, part of our radiation study, the difference between, uh, here we go, you ready, Patrick? Yes, sir. The difference between robot and manual was about three minutes uh, on average. So it adds about, you know, between two and five minutes in our hands once you get experienced at it. So um, if I have an unstable patient, I don't, I don't think we should be wasting, you know, using any extra time at all. So I don't use it in people that are in shock or, or unstable. Um, in people that have chronic total occlusions, very calcified lesions, very tortuous lesions that I'm not sure I'm going to be able to do manually, I certainly don't recommend doing the... Uh, robot. In all other cases, I think it's worth uh, using. We've done, in our first 60 cases, 57% were type B2 or C lesions. We've done occlusions of the one, the case, one case I did last year was an occluded RCA that was about eight weeks old clinically. Got it open uh, easily with a, with a balloon for backing. Um, we do vein grafts. We do hybrid procedures with the spider FX filter wire where we put the wire up with the robot. We measure the lesion, manually put the filter up. Uh, robotically place the stent and then manually extract the spider FX wire. Um, it's got a side port for two wires. It also has a side port you can put a uh, guide liner in and use the guide liner with this device. So to answer your question, I look to use it er in everyone. Uh, the folks I don't use it in are unstable patients or very tortuous calcified vessels or chronic total occlusions that, that um, would be a challenge even manually. What about the sedation? Should the patient be fully sedated? What is the sedation you are giving? Um, this man got a milligram of lorazepam by mouth over in the outpatient bay. He's going to get a, a TR band on here till about uh, um, 11.30 our time, which I guess would be, uh, 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 well, five hours ahead of your time. He'll be home, he'll be home here for lunch uh, by noon. Usually we keep folks about two to two and a half hours after uh, radial band and uh, uh, he's already on clopidogrel and aspirin. Uh, if he ambulates fine, his his, his uh, wrist looks fine. We just don't have him flex the wrist for the for the rest of the day, and uh, I'll see him in the clinic in the next uh, four weeks. So he got a milligram of lorazepam by mouth. If he needs more, we give we give that or versed IV. Can I uh, can I ask how much the uh, machine costs roughly in U.S. dollars? Yeah, um, well, that, you know, again, I, I, I'm not uh, on their sales force. I, uh, I think it was around the uh, whole unit was about $300,000. Um, we have a foundation, and our administration asked us what we could do to um, assist in patient care and assist the staff, improve patient care, assist the staff. Um, they had us look at it. We thought it was uh, very attractive from a radiation safety standpoint, from a precision standpoint, from an outcome standpoint. We thought it would improve the care of our patients. Uh, and our foundation generously purchased it. Um, when we looked at our first 60 cases, we wanted to see, did we save any stents? You know, does this, uh, can this device help you save stents by being more precise? In our first 60 cases, we could prove we saved five stents. And those are the cases where we actually estimated the lesion to be longer. And we put in one stent instead of two or two stents instead of three because we've got a more precise, shorter measurement. The bigger group of patients are the patients who were, were underestimating the lesion length where we potentially may have put a second stent in if we had longitudinal geographic miss, or they potentially could have come back for a re-emission. 
And so there's a large percentage of that other 32% of folks that potentially we saved since. So we could prove that we saved um, about eight and a half, uh, 8.7% of stents in our first 60 cases. So um, they've been happy with our success. They've been happy with uh, stent savings. Certainly that's a small sample and, and you need to have a long-term follow-up. Um, yeah. uh, it may not be cost savings up front, but it may be cost effective in the long run when you look at repeat procedures, readmissions, and things like that. Yeah. And can I ask you, do, do you know what your annual effective dose is? Do you know your personal ED for the last 12 months and the previous 12 months before you had the device? Is there a change? Uh, we're going to look at that. I know, you know, we, we have our standard badges that get sent down every month to our Radiation Safety Committee and we get a yearly report. Um, I have not, uh, that's a good point. It's a good thing to do. I do not have that data, but um, uh, I will look into that. We, uh, you know, we have, we've been tracking it for years. You know, this they say it'll be 25 years next year, so I can get all my annual uh, radiation doses over the past several years, and we can see if there's a significant yeah. drop. It would be worth uh, looking at it and seeing what happens. Uh, to be, yeah, I mean, I know what, what mine is, which is about a millisievert a year, which is very low, in fact, and it would be hard to get it much lower than that, even with the robot. So, you know, if you get good at radiation protection, you don't actually, in routine practice without the robot, you don't get too much radiation. Yeah, I think, you know, that's one aspect. I think, you know, sitting here without lead, uh, we're going to be talking about using drug uh, eluding scaffolds and visualization. You know, this screen's less than a foot in front of me. Um, I'm not leaning over a table looking at a screen that's six feet away. Um, you know, if I can extend my career with a good back and not have to stop doing interventions another 10 or 20 years, that would be ideal. I enjoy what I do here. So um, I think we as physicians and cardiologists need to start looking out for ourselves. Uh, you know, yeah. there's, there's patient safety and patient success. There's also uh, staff safety and, yeah. you know, radiation, uh, orthopedic issues, poster lane cataracts. These are all things. There's an elephant in the room that no one's really been talking about for years. And finally, now we're starting to recognize this and people are, are, are uh, looking at it. So I think ergonomics, I think orthopedics, I think radiation, you know, cataracts, I think all this are factors that, that we all need to be cognizant of and, and I think the next generation is in fact more cognizant than my generation when we first came out. Okay, well look Paul, that's a, that's a fantastic demonstration of what that uh, equipment can do. You made a very clear and strong and, and well uh, argued case for why it is a good device to have, but for both for radiation protection and for um, operator comfort. So we've probably got time. Is, is there any questions? Yeah. Uh, I just want to have one question. Um, is there a guide adjustment tool while you're exchanging balloons? I mean, we always see this when we get the balloon out, we suck the guide in. The, is there an adjustment tool on the arm or you have to step in, kind of readjust your guide? It didn't happen yeah, in this case. It went this great, but just in case it happens. Yeah, there is a, a tool that, that, that clamps, that clips onto the guide. Um, and sometimes we have the, if, if despite that it, it deep seeds, we have the, uh, the, the technician hold the guide while we're, while we're pulling back. Um, you can actually learn a push-pull technique with a balloon and a wire or a stent and a wire. Um, you lose the tactile sensation, which really is not that important, which is a big concern for everybody. But there's some tricks in terms of push-pull with the guide, I mean with the uh, wire and balloons and with stents. The next iteration of this uh, uh, core path system is, my understanding, going to have a third joystick that's going to control um, rotation of 360 degrees and forward back when movement um, of the guider. Um, I think a key thing with doing robotic intervention is having good guide support like a key to any interventional case, uh, but particularly with, uh, with the robotic device, um, it's worth taking an extra two to five minutes to get a good guide that sits in well, you know, the key to, uh, to any case is good guide support. Um, uh, but that is something that they're planning on putting in. I'm not sure it's going to affect me that much because I usually, we usually have good guide support when we do these cases. Um, uh, but that is, that is a good point. Tim. I just wanted to ask, what, what is your current percentage of your total workload you do robotically and what, what do you think the ceiling is? The, the reason I ask is I just, I've got a bad back and I suspect that most of my back trauma and my x-ray dose is actually in a relatively small number of cases. My registrar would have done that case, so I'd have had zero dose in that particular case. But the ones I scrub in for and I'm there for two hours because it's a complex, difficult case. I wonder if you ever think those could be done robotically and, and in fact, in practice, would this potentially not reduce x-ray dose because of the concentration in more complex cases? 
Well, I, you know, I, I think uh, complex cases can be done. Uh, Shami Mahmood at University of California, San Diego, has, has shown some fine examples of that as well. Um, I think this is where this device comes in, and they're actually looking for approval for, for peripherals because my, uh, my understanding, I don't do peripherals, but my partners do, that working down the leg can take hours in, in long, tedious cases. So I think actually complex, long cases is where you want to use this device. Um, you know, in terms of in terms of uh, fatigue, in terms of improving concentration, um, being able to sit down in cases that take several hours is is where this really has a niche. I think you're going to see it not only in the corners; you're going to see it elsewhere, peripherally, perhaps cerebrally, a lot of different vessels. So, I think those those are the cases where actually uh, being having better ergonomics, having better visualization, uh, having the ability to to uh, sit down and be radiation shielded is where this has a a, a nice niche. Um, so, so yeah, I think uh, complex cases are, uh, again, uh, more than half of our initial cases were B2 and C lesions, um, and I th that doesn't stop me from using it. The main issue for me is going to be an uh, unstable patient or somebody with a very tortuous calcified vessel that I'm not sure I'm going to get across even manually. Uh, those are the two limitations. Uh, the okay. other question, you know, I would estimate maybe, maybe 50 to 75% of my cases are done robotically. Well, in order to try and keep things to time, we're probably going to have to cut the broadcast there. But that is a fantastic display and a demonstration of what you can do with that robotic device. And thanks a lot. Great. Thank you very much for having us. Appreciate it.